Hello, good afternoon. People are still gathering. We'll give it a couple minutes. Good. Thank you so much for showing up. I know we had uh, clear skies and rain again. I don't know what's going on now, but whatever's going on out there, we appreciate you coming in here and spending your Saturday afternoon with us. And uh, you can always focus on our upcoming author, who's very bright, sunny, wonderful personality, or the yellow flowers. <laughs> Do it too. Um, thank you so much for Book Passage. We really appreciate uh, you supporting Book Passage events like this, supporting authors. Uh, it just keeps us going, and we've got a lot to say in the month of March. We've got a lot of events coming up. Some are ticketed, some are like this where they're not ticketed. Uh, but check out our website for the latest of what's coming up. Um, and today is no exception for something very special. Do we need, we do have some seats right kind of closer to the front. Annalise, why don't you sit up front? Uh oh, nothing like getting called out. <laughs> Whether you want to or not. <laughs> and my guess is if you're here, you're probably also not only a lover of books and book passage, but probably a little bit of a writer inside of you. Um, or you need some a little self-discovery we're still kind of in the early days of the new year so that's all applicable for today's event uh, writing by heart by our featured author Meredith Heller invites you to write as a path towards self-understanding and as a lifelong refuge of steadfast friendship with yourself she uses the power of writing to heal and save her own life and now she teaches others to do the same in this book, right here, out in paperback, uh, Meredith shares the techniques she developed to help people from all walks of life explore their emotions, find their voice, and better navigate life's challenges. And obviously we're a bookstore, so we fully support all of the above. As a poet, singer, songwriter, avid nature lover, and educator with degrees in writing and education, Meredith is so qualified to deliver this message. She is a California poet in the schools. She leads writing workshops at public and private uh, schools, juvenile detention centers, women's prisons, the Institute for Poetic Medicine, and the Kennedy Center for the Arts, and so much more. With that, I would love to all of us give a very warm welcome on this whole day to Mary Heller. Thank you. Oh, friends, thank you so much. Wow, so many of you showed up. Hi, thank you so much. Do I really need to talk in this? Yeah, you do. Yeah, 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 really? Yeah. You guys can't hear me? No. Thank you so so much for coming out today in the rain and so many people are sick right now I got so many messages that said oh my god I've had this on my calendar for two months and I'm at I'm at home sick in bed but I'm with you there in spirit so I just want to welcome all the spirits but there's a lot of spirits here today just saying okay <laughs> I'm so excited to be here with you today and to share with you my new book, Writing by Heart, A Poetry Path to Healing and Self-Discovery, published by New World Library. This is my second book published by New World Library. The first book, Write a Poem, Save Your Life. Can you guys hear me in the back? No, you gotta hold no. on. Oh, really? Wow, okay. <clears throat> How about like that? Better? Yeah. Okay, way better? Okay, you should tell me. Okay, so, um, Writing by Heart, A Poetry Path to Healing and Self-Discovery, published by New World Library. My first book, published by New World Library, is Write a Poem, Save Your Life. And this came out in 2021, during the pandemic. And everybody's been asking me, Meredith, how long did it take you to write the second book? And the short answer is two years. Hi. 
right. And the long answer, the true answer, of course, is my whole life. <laughs> And I've been thinking recently a lot about how the first book, Write a Poem, Save Your Life, it feels like I wrote it in blood. And this new book, Writing by Heart, it feels like I wrote it in honey. And it's the journey from survival to love. And I think so many of us are on this journey in our own ways. And like Ram Das says, we're all just walking each other home. Writing is a path home. I walk myself and others home through poetic writing. Welcome. So I'd like to start today with a poem that I wrote called At Nine Years Old. And it's about going for a really long walk with my mother and sister in Washington, D.C., where I grew up. And it's how my muse found me at nine years old. <coughs> at nine years old, I rule the world, skipping through the grass along the reflecting pool in Washington, D.C. on an impossibly humid day in late August. My mother leading the way on one of her epic walkabouts, a bohemian cheerleader in pigtails and bell bottoms, tipsy on life, singing a song. Only she knows. <laughs> and my sister, sulking behind us, overwrought and angry, fighting the world for my mother's undivided attention, which none of us will ever receive. <laughs> and I, elven-hearted and porous, dunk my head into the fountain and hold my breath while the world and the war and the heat drain away and in that cool dark emptiness a single thread of melody rises and whispers itself into my left ear like a vow I come up for air, whipping my hair in an arc of splintered light, and I am humming raw and incandescent. is about how my muse found me. It's about how I found my poetry and my music and how I found my voice. This book is an invitation for your muse to find you, for you to find your poetry and the musicality of your words, for you to find your voice. So I'd like to read a little bit to you from the introduction. So many of my friends are here. Thank you so much. It's so <laughs> nice to see your faces. Oh my God. I love you, Meredith. Welcome to Writing by Heart. We are about to embark on a journey into deep self. A wild and wonderful journey to help you discover your heart, your truth, your voice, and there's no wrong way. There is only you discovering your way, step by step, word by word, an adventure. Let's get started. What does writing by heart mean? Well, I've always loved the concept of doing something by heart. When we do it by heart, we do it with an organic knowing in our bones and blood, whether it's reciting a poem, singing a song, or walking a forest trail. Doing it by heart means we've made it our own. It has become part of us, like a friend. 
We can trust ourselves to know it and we can trust that it will be there when we need it. My hope for you is that this poetry path becomes just that, a path of trust in which you befriend yourself and your writing and that it leads you home to love. I had a yoga teacher who used to say, this is not a yoga perfect, it's a yoga practice. So allow me to whisper in your ear as you write, this is not a writing perfect, it's a writing practice. There's no goal to attain, no perfection to achieve, nowhere to get to and no one to impress. Writing practice is about showing up and being present with yourself, however good or bad you feel. Noticing what arises for you here and now with curiosity and kindness. Your pen is the key and your paper is the door. Put your pen to paper and open the door. What's on the other side of the door? Your stories poems, songs, ready to spill forth. Writing is a practice of trust. I like to say that the poem knows the poem. I promise that the more you write, the more fluent you'll become in writing by heart. You'll learn to touch your truth, turn the past into compost, unearth juicy insights, and point the compass of your heart in any direction you choose. When you put your pen to paper, you will reap the harvest of your hardest lessons. Tap the fountain of your wild wisdom, rebirth and reinvent yourself again and again as you weave your disconnected parts back into healing and wholeness because writing is magic. Writing is medicine. So writing was and is the medicine that healed me and saved my life. So when you read the introduction to write a poem, save your life, you'll learn the story about how writing poetry saved my life when I was a teen and had left home at 12, 13 years old and raised myself living out in domes I built in the woods along the Potomac River in Maryland, 20 minutes outside of Washington, D.C., where I grew up. I lived in domes I built, I lived in abandoned houses, and I lived in old barns. And I was very alone, I was, um, I had a lot of trauma, I was deeply depressed, um, obviously not anymore, um, <laughs> um, and, um, and all of my friends were dying of suicide and drug overdose, and I wasn't far behind them. But poetry found me. I would get the first line of poetry, I'm also a singer-songwriter, or song in my left ear like a lifeline or a work permit that said, stay here. Find the words that name and shape the loss and the longing until you come out to a place of clarity and understanding and even perhaps beauty. And when you read the introduction to write a poem, save your life, you'll understand how I came to realize that poetry is my path. It's my passion and my purpose, and it is what I came here to share with you and the world. So I'd like to read to you from chapter six in Writing by Heart. This chapter is called Sanctuary, and I'm gonna read you a section called Dark Whisperer. It goes like this. Welcome to the unknown, the deepest, darkest, unspoken, hidden, underground, underbelly shadow self. You know, 
all the stuff we push away the pain the hurt the shame the fear the longing the desire the dream what we're rarely told is that the very stuff we push away and hide is where our power lives when we bring the deep dark hidden stuff out into the light of day and pick through it sifting and sorting naming and claiming we free up the energy we spent keeping it at bay when we befriend the dark parts forgive and reclaim the parts we could not love we unearth the energy we need to fuel our creativity our dreams our life a seed germinates in the dark earth because this darkness is where the juju lives we think we're keeping ourselves safe by keeping secrets but those secrets end up owning us and feeding on our life force whisper their names now and they will whisper you back to life so i'd like to read you an example poem from this section dark whisperer this is one of my pieces it's called tell it to the river. The barn on Trevilla Road along the Potomac River in Maryland, where I made a home at 13, slept on the floor with an old sleeping bag from Salvation Army, hung a torn lace curtain in the window where the glass had long been broken. I ate stale rye bread from the trash, spent my quarters on a tin of Medaglia d'Oro coffee, dark and sweet, like the beekeeper boy I kiss behind the hive for a jar of local honey, my skin buzzing, tell it to the river. I was 15, living in a log cabin in the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains, Virginia, no electricity, no running water, with Willie, 28, who kicked around in a pair of red Converse high tops, pinned me to the hood of his station wagon and held his hand over my mouth so no one would hear me scream, tell it to the river. I made bracelets from copperhead snakes I found dead on the road, taught myself to tan their skins by slicing them open, scooping out their guts. Once I found a baby bird inside, once a handful of fleshy eggs. I'd nail the skins to a wooden board, salt them and leave them to dry in the sun, cut the skin into strips, sew them around a piece of rope attached to a tube of beads I made in a pattern called peyote stitch I learned from the women on the Navajo reservation. I'd sell them in town for 20 bucks, which was a lot of food money back then. Tell it to the river. The boy I met one summer whose skin was made of cinnamon sticks, who sat all day at the water's edge singing in a language no one knew but me. We watched the water braid the light and helixes. We made love in a circle of pines under a full moon. And three days later, we found his body suicide. I crawled inside myself and didn't speak for many months when I was a teen on my own, trading my sex for survival, my love for belonging. Tell it to the river. My friend Annalise, 88 year old Swiss artist who simply is not old. She's sitting right there. She's tiny and strong and determined as a beetle. Hands constantly making things come to life. Paper and glass, paint and clay. She keeps bees, feeds the raccoons, cheats at cards, cusses worse than I do when she loses, yodels expertly and rides downhill every morning on her kick scooter to swim in the pool. She was my first true friend. She found me when I was a lone wolf, my skin chewed raw, my fur full of sparks. And slowly she shaped me like one of her clay pots with space inside, I messed that up. Slowly she shaped me like one of her clay pots 
into a human being with space inside for homemade soup. Tell it to the river. <laughs> to all the bards along my path who wonder where I go, when I go, who know me as the wolf-hearted woman with one eye dark and one eye bright, one eye that looks inward and one that looks out, one that draws you closer while the other pushes you away. Tell it to the river. The way the water loosens my hinges, turns my blood to opals, throws herself against me, purring like some wild beast. I rest my head against her chest, listen to her heartbeat. Yes, now. Yes, now. The sun climbs the ridge in the morning and we howl together because it's good to be alive and say so. Tell it to the river. <laughs> so I was a poet in the schools for 30 years, first in Boulder, Colorado, and then here in Marin County. And I got kids from first through 12th grade up, out of their seats, into their bodies, into their senses, into their imaginations, and out their voices. And it was thrilling to help these kids find the words and shape the poems that express what matters to them. And then watch them get up in front of a class of 30 or 40 of their peers with their hands and their voice shaking and be received and witnessed and celebrated and sit down as if they've grown wings. And then the pandemic and all my classes and all that aliveness got squished into my then 13 inch laptop screen for Zoom classes. 30 and 40 kids whose faces were no bigger than postage stamps. And the kids struggled to pay attention and I struggled to keep them engaged. And after a few years of five and six classes a day on Zoom, I burned out and the kids turned into Zoom zombies. <laughs> My passion at that time was teaching poetry, private poetry workshops for teen girls for empowerment and self-expression. In fact, my teen girls were right here doing a poetry reading in March uh, 2019. March 2019, Moon Tribe, right here. They were amazing. So one of the mothers of one of the girls who came to my private poetry classes said, Meredith, would you teach a class for me and a few of my women friends? And I said, God, I don't know if I know enough to teach adult women. And she said, oh, Meredith. <laughs> I've been secretly sitting outside my daughter's door for years, listening in on your workshops and doing the writing, and I definitely think you know enough. <laughs> so much for confidentiality. <laughs> So I opened the first women's workshop in October of 2020 with eight women, mostly from Marin and the Bay Area. And it was called Elemental Wisdom. And we called on the power of the elements, earth, air, fire, water, to revitalize our lives, which had gotten so small during quarantine and isolation, and to revitalize our dreams and our passions. And we met once a week for five weeks. And when that workshop was over, those women asked for another workshop. And this time they returned with their friends from all over the country. And we went from one cohort to two to three. We recently outgrew our flower pots. And we now have five cohorts. The beauty of Zoom is that we have women from all over the country, even all over the world. We have women who Zoom with us from Egypt and Croatia and the Netherlands and New Zealand and England and Alaska and Nova Scotia and everywhere across the US. And we're growing. 
I'd like to read to you from chapter three, Body Language. So I was a body worker, a massage therapist specializing in doing rehab of spinal cord injury patients for 27 years. Um, I, have, I have worked with hundreds of thousands of bodies. And what I learned is that the body holds all of the stories of our lives. And if we invite it and give it permission and give it an opening, it will teach us its language, its medicine, it's music. So body language is a really big, big chapter in this book. And I'd like to read to you from a section in body language called Sacred Wound. Let's start by singing all the wounded parts home. You know that old song, Dem Bones? The hip bone connected to the knee. Knee bone and the knee bone connected to the ankle. Ankle bone, ankle bone connected to the foot. Foot bone. Okay, good. Now you know it. Okay, hold that thought for one second. Thank you. Feel free to make up the words the way we do in my workshop. The heart bone connected to the wound bone and the wound bone connected to the courage. Courage bone and the courage bone connected to the hope. Hope bone and the hope bone connected to the joy. Joy bone and the joy bone connected to the wisdom. Wisdom bone and the wisdom bone connected to the moon. Moon bone, moon bone connected to the song. Song bone, oh yeah. Thank you so much for singing. <laughs> we all have cracks in our bodies, places of wounding. The late great poet and songwriter Leonard Cohen said in his song anthem, there is a crack, a crack in everything. It's how the light gets in. He echoed Rumi, the wound is the place where the light enters you. We'll work with this concept as we enter a wound or crack in our bodies, bringing our warmth and love there, welcoming it back to the hearth of our bodies and discovering how this crack helps us open so the light can get in. Some of us have many wounds, many cracks, so much light. <laughs> Let's explore the power and medicine that hide in these wounded places and discover how we can make peace with them bringing our loving kindness there so we can open and live more fully. And I'd like to share with you a poem from this section called Empty Gap by Lauren Montgomery. Lauren is a beautiful poet and singer-songwriter who lives in Nevada City, California, where I spend my summers camping and writing along the Yuba River. <laughs> Empty Gap, Lauren Montgomery. There was an empty gap where some thing should be. The sound of a single drip, drop within a hollow cave. I lit a fire there because I wanted to see in the cold, dark. And it grew my little fire, setting off the alarms of chaos, the out of control. In my panic, I ran, but my speed only fed the fire. The fear was thick and I choked my weighted conscience, a crown of thorns, the fetters of feminism wrapped around my waist. There was another thing there with me in the dark, a hungry animal, also very much afraid, starving, tired creature, and I had only more heavy, cold fears to feed her. She wanted to be full. She appeared so ferocious in this simple carnal need, but I didn't remember how or where to find a little nourishment. Thick shame that drove her when she remembered how to eat, breaking free to gorge her hungry bones on anything around my heart broke for her today. And in my hollow place, she had left liquid light spilling in through the opening she had torn in me. Empty gap, Lauren Montgomery.
So the workshops that I teach meet um, once a week on Zoom for five week series. Then we take two weeks off in between to let people catch their breath and let me create the next series. And, um, and we roll this way through the whole year, including the summer. <coughs> Workshops are inhabited by women warrior poets, brave and beautiful and vulnerable and genuine who show up each week and dig deep to discover the treasures that revitalize their passion and their purpose. Some of the women who come to workshop and who have poems in this book are sitting next to you today. If you have a poem in this book or you come to workshop, would you stand up, please? Thank you so much for the way you show up. Thank you for walking this journey together. I do believe we are healing the world, one new poet and one new poem at a time. So in 2022, I moved to the California desert because it's warm and affordable, but I found out I am not a cactus. I am a fern. <laughs> and ferns grow really well in Marin. <laughs> but I had a hot, long, lonely year in the desert and I sat down with all the workshop material and I thought, God, this is so great. The invitations are amazing. The poems are mind-blowing, heartbreaking open. I have to share this with the world. So I wrote the second book very much the way I wrote the first book. I'm kind of a full immersion person. And I had two weeks off between um, workshops. So I got up every day. I walked five miles. I swam for an hour. And then I sat down for 12 hours a day. And I wrote the entire first draft of this book in two weeks. And then I spent the next two years making it sing. And then this fern moved back to Marin. To show you the range of the kind of invitations for writing that you'll find in this book, or if you come to workshop, I'd like to share with you another piece from um, Body Language. And this is the very last section of Body Language, which I call the tail section. And the section is called, remember this is Body Language, the section is called Ode to the Tush. Yeah. We really like to have fun in workshop. So um, this poem is a great poem, and it's called My Tush and I by Verana Belowitz, who's in the house. Yeah. My Tush and I, Verana Belowitz. I'm rather fond of my tush. I take her everywhere. <laughs> Last week I took her to a meditation retreat, and I sat with her for eight hours long days. My tush and I and my thoughts. For eight long days we sat, we stayed all day long, perched upon my derriere. I sat, we sat, my tush and I. Thoughts arose. What will I wear tomorrow? I want to get a bite to eat. I'm sad. I'm angry. I'm tired. I want to stand and hike, dance and sway. I feel connected. Now I don't. We watched my thoughts, my tush and I as they rolled in and floated away. My tush gripped when I attached. My tush softened <laughs> when I released. I sat on my tush and thought about life. I sat on my tush and thought about death. Who am I? What am I becoming? How do I want to live? How? Do I want to die? My tush and I listen to Dharma talks about the four noble truths about dukkha, inevitable suffering, the five hindrances to awakening, about loving kindness, compassion, and equanimity. At times, my tush went numb, but still, <laughs> we sat, my tush and I, dissolving separation layer after layer, letting go of things needing to be different 
my tush and I became one. <laughs> the more we sat, the more I gathered myself in here. I am here. Me and my tush, my tush and I. <laughs> Verana Bailowitz. <laughs> doing you want more <laughs> one more you do so our workshops have grown into this incredibly warm rich community uh, we laugh and cry together we write incredible poems that make us laugh and cry and uh, we celebrate and support each other and we find healing and wholeness and discovery in this kind of personal, expressive, self-reflective writing that we do. Two really important things happen in workshop. One, as we share our pieces and hear other people's pieces, we get the sense of commonality, right? As human beings, we pretty much have the same needs and wants and hurts and loves and desires and longings. We learn we're not alone. Paradoxically, we learn that our story is unique and that it matters. And the way that we weave it and voice it and share it is necessary in the whole community of life. I'm using poetry these days as an umbrella term to hold space for this kind of personal, self-reflective writing that we do. We show up and we take an honest dip What's bubbling up here in my belly, in my heart, in response to the world? And, and then we give our attention to it with kindness, curiosity, courage, and we write about what we discover. And if you come to workshop or when you're writing along with the book, all forms of writing are welcome. People are getting really upset about, I'm not a poet. It's okay. You can write in any way that you want. People who come to workshops and work with the book, you can write poetry, prose, story, song lyrics, mind spill, heart spill. Make up your own form, just write. And all of you is welcome. Your sadness, your longing, your depression, your lethargy, your hot mess, your brilliance, your bravery, your beauty, your love, your longing, your desire, all of it is welcome. By making room for all of us, we become whole. We become whole and this is how we heal. I'd like to read you another part in the book. Um, this is chapter seven called Belonging. The invitation was to weave the abandoned parts of yourself back in to belonging. And I'm going to read to you from a section called Permission. <coughs> permission? We're adults. We don't need no stinking permission. <laughs> and yet we do. We really, truly do. We need permission to be ourselves. We need permission to make mistakes and learn to be a mess and fall apart, to rest and replenish when we're used up. We need permission to stop apologizing for our brilliance, our bravery, our love, our strength. We need permission to change. We need permission for our self-expression, our cycles of fallow and fruitful. We need permission for belonging and fulfillment and joy. We need permission to dream big. We need permission to be exactly who we are. There was a Facebook video that went viral about a little girl, three years old, who comes out of the bathroom with lipstick on, or as she calls it, yippick. And her dad lovingly grills her. Is it hers or her mother's? He probes, did you ask anyone if you could put that lipstick on? And she answers candidly, I asked myself. <laughs> this always cracks me up, but it also hits home in a big way. So I ask you now, what do you need to ask yourself and give yourself permission for? 
I'll share an example poem called Permission by Karen Burt Emira. Karen lives in the East Bay. She's a retired OBGYN doctor. She comes to all of our workshops. Permission by Karen Burt Emira. I give myself and anyone who wants to join me permission to rant and rage, to break some teeth and necks with words that slice and bite, chew and spit, kick hard. Who gave permission to burn the Amazon? Who gave permission to poison living soil, fresh wind, pure water? Who gave permission to spread lies brazenly for profit and power? Who gave permission for greed? Who gave permission to traffic babies and film them being raped and beat? Who gave permission to the KKK to lynch and bring children to watch? Who gave permission for slavery that continues on and on and on? Who gave permission for cruelty to run free? And what has all this got to do with giving permission to my ragged voice to sing beautiful songs. Permission for cruelty is a thorn stuck deep in my throat, a tightening noose around my diaphragm, a howl and a shriek, a thousand year long scream, no! Oh yeah, my body is trauma informed, at times contorted and deformed from despair. So I give my ragged voice permission to sing beautiful songs, to make joyful sounds, to speak in tongues from my own territories. Because this duality is my humanity. I give myself permission to crack open from fear and grief and fury. I give myself permission to break open wide with joy and purpose and love. Karen Burt Emira. Karen tells this great story. She was sitting with her father a couple of years ago while he was dying. And she was telling him about our poetry workshops. And he said, but do you read the greats? Do you read Wordsworth and Ezra Pound and Allen Ginsberg and Dylan Thomas? Do you read the greats? And Karen said, I think the women who come to our workshops are the greats. <laughs> Karen is one of the greats. You want more? Yeah. Just a um, there it is. Yeah. I want you to mention also the prison women. She did incredible. My friend Annalise says prison. I'm supposed to mention my prison women. <laughs> yeah. I, I haven't gotten there yet, but thank oh, you. Oh, I I'm will. Sorry. I totally will. I just um, <clears throat> so I was going to do just a really quick thank you. I want to thank my agent, Patrick Miller. Uh, he found me uh, through an essay I wrote for Common Ground magazine called Love's Forge, Losing My Innocence. And Patrick emailed me and said, you are a fierce writer. Do you have a book to write? And I said, yes. And then I said, yikes. And I had two weeks off from teaching in the Marin schools. And I went home and I sat down for two weeks. And I wrote the first draft to write a poem, Save Your Life. And then I spent a year making it sing. Patrick, thank you for believing in me. I want to thank my friend John Fox, who is the founder of the Institute for Poetic Medicine. And um, he wrote the foreword to this book, and it's like walking into a huge heart. John's heart. Oh my God, what a heart. And he found my first book and got in touch with me and said, um, I love the work you're doing. I'd like to have the Institute for Poetic Medicine support you however we can in the work you're doing. So I teach workshops for them, and they give me a grant every year to go into a woman's prison in Minnesota and do poetry writing with the incarcerated women. <coughs> there are a few poems in here from those women. 
And I would like to thank New World Library for believing in me two times. <laughs> um, Georgia Hughes, Mark Allen, and my rock star publicist, Kim Corbin. Thank you, New World Library, for, for helping me to share my journey about the healing and transformative power of poetry writing. You know, writing is a relationship with ourselves and our creativity. And when it's flowing, we are part of something that is bigger than us, and we are always transformed in the process. I was definitely transformed by these books. When I'm writing a poem, there isn't the me that's writing the poem and the poem, there is simply poeming. Um, and I think like any creative, I would argue, I don't know if I wrote the books or the books wrote me. Always transformed. Uh, when I was a teen living on my own in the woods, I carried two books around with me everywhere I went. Creative Visualization by Shakti Gawain and Astrology for the New Age by Marcus Allen. Shakti and Marcus started a little big publishing company called New World Library. In essence, New World Library helped shape me into a human being and a writer worthy of their publishing. And I am grateful and humbled and thrilled. It is such a wild, full circle experience to be published by New World Library. Yeah. Um, okay, so one of the main things I learned from creative visualization uh, I'd always had a very rich imagination and inner life. I had an imaginary friend when I was a kid. Anybody else have an imaginary friend? Yes. <laughs> awesome. Uh, so what I learned in creative visualization was that I could put my imagination to work for me to create a life I love that feeds my soul and feeds others. Uh, so in every section of this book, there's a subsection called body mindfulness. And it's a guided journey or meditation that helps you access the information in your body, in your senses, in your felt experience, in your imagination from deep psyche that will inform your writing. So do those, they're good. Um, one of my favorite kinds of journeys to do is to call on an animal ally to help with healing or help navigate life's changes and challenges. So we did a workshop called Metamorphosis. It's chapter 14, the last chapter in the book. And we followed the journey that a butterfly goes, from, goes through, from pupa to caterpillar to chrysalis to winged one to adult butterfly. And we inhabited each stage of the journey as if we were going through it so that we could track our cycles of change and becoming and transformation. And so I'd like to read you a piece, a closing piece from this chapter and this section. And um, the section is called Great Butterfly Being and the poem is called Blue Morpho by Nicole Phillips. A really quick story about Nicole Phillips. I met Nicole Phillips when she was 15. I was living in Boulder, Colorado, doing the poetry program at Naropa, where Allen Ginsberg and Jack Kerouac started the writing program, the School of Disembodied Poetics. I think my school is the School of Embodied Poetics, but that's a story for another day. So um, I would set up programs in all the schools in Boulder, and all the alternatives high schools, and Nicole Phillips was a student in one of those high schools and came to all of my poetry classes. Flash forward 20 years, this is probably seven or eight years ago now, I'm in the East Bay at dance, and a beautiful young woman walks up to me and says, did you used to teach poetry at New Vista High School in Boulder, Colorado? And I looked at her for a long moment, and then I grabbed her and hugged her. Nicole just turned 43. She is a tremendous poet and person. She comes to all of our workshops. She splits her time between San Francisco and Costa Rica. She's traveling to Costa Rica right now or she'd be sitting right there. This is her poem, Blue Morpho, by Nicole Phillips. <clears throat> she graced me 
in the early morning, a floating flash, a bold burlesque dancer wrapped in a blue scarf, circus star of a jungle accompanied by an orchestra of cicadas and frogs and scarlet macaws, howler monkeys, toucans, all keeping the thick pulse. I am entranced as she bursts through the sound score with a wisp of metallic blue, sparkles of fairy dust tease behind her. Her voice is her flight. She splashes giant waxy green jungle leaves with her hot blue paint that comes to rest her black string legs on my green bamboo shorts pocket seasoned with jungle scents I haven't washed in days. <laughs> I gaze into her toasted wooden brown underwing as she masquerades as tree notches. Their 14 eyes stare back at me, flares of blue flaming magic on one side, earth on the other side, transformation doesn't have to be traumatic. She stays on my clothes for a whole blessed minute. Blend in when you need to, she says. Be still, then razzle dazzle life with a striking color. Your color is your voice. Blue Morpho, Nicole. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. So much joy to share this with you. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. I would love to open the floor for any questions you have, and then I will happily sign your books when my hands stop shaking. <laughs> and I have a mic, so let's mic it up, people. Who's first? I still would like you to talk about the present women. You did such a good job. My friend Annalise, 88 year old Swiss artist who simply is not old. She is tiny and strong and determined as a beetle. Love it. And it's my job to make fun of her. Um, she wants me to talk about the prison work that I did. Well, it was really very important. It, it is really it's important. Really Thank you. Fabulous photos. Were yeah, it, it's amazing. Um, so, uh, Institute of Poetic Medicine has been giving me this grant each year, and I teach on Zoom into the uh, women's prison in, in Minnesota, at Shakopee Women's Prison in Minnesota. And um, boy, these women, let me tell you, they are real and raw and willing to show up and do their work, like make their atonement, not with the world, but with themselves. And being with them and working with them and, and giving them like really loving, supportive feedback, which I don't think they get a lot of, is, is just such a, a fulfilling experience for me. And they all get a copy of this book and now they'll get a copy of this book and when I finished the last series there, they said, God, Meredith, we're really going to miss you. But we have a copy of your book, and we're going to keep writing. Mm -hmm. And that was it. I lost it. <laughs> Tears. Yeah. Thanks, Thank you. Yeah. What else? Good Hi. Back. I just want to tell a little merited story that's not getting told here. Uh, when I first took her book out, um, I, I was very enthused about it, but I was also, you know, skeptical. Poetry's not the biggest seller in the world. And this is my agent, by the way, you guys. <laughs> just so you know. And uh, uh, so I sent it out to 1820 houses, which is the usual. And um, Uniformly, I got the response, uh, great writer, wonderful idea, but she's just a Northern California poetry teacher. Where, where's our <laughs> national platform? How are we gonna sell thousands? And so uh, I relayed that to Meredith and said, wait, let's wait and see what happens. We'll, we might try a second round. And then the um, pandemic hit. And Meredith was out of work and publishers were not even going into their offices. And I thought, well, that's that. Two or three weeks later, Meredith writes me and says, okay, I have a national platform. 
<laughs> in that two to three weeks, she had created an online platform. I had never seen anything like it. Because normally in the, in the lit biz, um, you don't expect poets to be great publicizers. <laughs> and uh, so I told her, this is great. I'll, I'll hit all the houses again and uh, with the refurbished platform and increased potential. Two houses said they would take another look, and Georgia at New World said, I'm sold, let's do it. <laughs> Thank you, Patrick. Patrick believed in me twice, too. Thank you. And my next question, back here. Hi, Marina. Hi. What was your first poem? Can you remember? No. Can you remember <laughs> what? My first poem was a song. What's it called? Moon. And I'm not gonna sing it. I was about one. I sang before I spoke. I still think that um, music is my, my mother tongue. She plays a fabulous guitar and she sings. <laughs> That's my friend, Annalise. <laughs> May you all have a friend. She goes to cafes and in Fairfax, and you can hear her there, and she's fabulous. Yes. <laughs> That's the truth. Can you bring that nice woman up? Yes, she so, does. So we can all, everybody can see her. Right Annalise, stand up. Come on, please. This is my, my best friend, Annalise. <laughs> She was playing guitars and she was a masseuse. She did all those things. And I said, You're great. And she said, oh, No, no, I'm not. Look what they come out of it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God for the homemade soup. <laughs> and it shows what a loving friend can yeah. nurture. And I got to tell you that this beautiful young woman, stand up, please. Um, who is about to talk to us um, is one of my beautiful teen poets who was up here uh, in March of 2019 reading her poetry on Ais. Yeah. Hi. Um, Thank I you. I have actually two questions. My first yeah. one is, um, are there any going to be any like teen um, programs? Because I miss writing poetry. And it's like during quarantine, like I didn't go through a rough time, but right now, um, I'm a sophomore in high school, and I've been going through a hard time. I think poetry really connected with me um, through hard times. So. I hear you. Thank okay. you so much for asking. Okay, I'll say yes. We will do that. <laughs> After the book launch, okay? <laughs> and my second question is, do you have a favorite poem that you've written? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> You guys want another poem? Yeah! Oh, God, okay. Yes, go All on. right. Um, this is from my collection, You Bewitch. And this is called Huntress of the Holy Sound. This is the only rhyming piece I've ever written. Huntress of the Holy Sound. I sat by the river and I listened to the water. She was singing about forgiveness. She was singing about hunger. She was singing a song of sunlight as my body rolled under. I asked the rocks and I asked the water what to do about my hunger while I chewed on rinds of anger by the mouth of the river. She sat down beside me, touched my skin with her fingers. Shake out your bones, you wild creature. Shake out your bones, you wild dancer. Gather and empty your blood of what aches and the moon will make her honey in the dark from your mistakes. I sat by the river and I listened to the water and her waves washed me over like the hands of the mother. I came clean to her gospel. I came hard to her thunder and her waves washed me over as my body rolled under. Let go your worries, lay your body down here at the river where the earth is hallowed ground. 
Let go your worries. Lay your body down. The gospel of the water will unwind what is bound. Light a flame for forgiveness. Light a flame for truth. Claim your worthiness of love. Grow into your youth. Come home to the river, home to this sacred sound where the water sings your name in the secret language that you found. There are circles on the water playing prism with the light. There are rocks carved with faces who tell your fortune in the night. She will wrap you in her rapture, share her pockets, treasures deep. Your tears will turn to temples in the healing of her heat. She'll sing a song of forgiveness in a hard-earned melody, and her music will absolve you of every wrongful deed. Whisper your prayers to the water, moan your desire to the moon, turn your wisdom into soil, seeds to plant, seeds to bloom. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hi. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. I couldn't hear but maybe 10 words because oh. I'm waiting for hearing aids. And I just had a question. Yeah. Have you ever thought of becoming an actress, too? <laughs> I had so much fun watching you. And it didn't matter that I only heard Washington, D.C. and permission. <laughs> So I love, love, love that you are working with women, and yay. But I am curious, have you ever thought about working with men? Yes, I have thought about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not an appropriate answer. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm having way too much fun. Um, okay, so uh, when I teach for other places, Creativity Summits, Healing Summits, the Institute for Poetic Medicine, all the classes are co-ed. Um, I started my classes for women because that was who asked in the beginning. And um, every time I ask the women if I can bring men to class, they say no. <laughs> there, there, there's this, in the beginning of the book, I talk about um, the lineage of women's circles and how we grow and need and learn through osmosis, hearing and sharing our stories with other women. However, there are a lot of uh, more men asking. I think this book is gonna bring a lot of men in, so I think I'll open some uh, co-ed cohorts, but then also keep some just for the women who just want women. <laughs> okay, I feel guilty. Don't feel guilty, because I can, well anyway, I only want to know if are all these workshops that you do Zoom? Yes, right okay. now they are. Oh, but I also do in-person retreats. Okay. <clears throat> so we did our first in-person retreat uh, last summer at the Yuba River, which is my muse, Yuba Witch, you know. And um, and and we'll do more. And and really, my goal. So nature is 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 my muse. Um, I really call on the metaphors and the feeling that I have when I'm in nature to teach me how to be human, to teach me how to navigate this human experience. So my vision is to do nature and writing retreats in all the most beautiful nature places, if not just in the US, all over the world, and invite everybody. Yeah. On that note, let's get Meredith up. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Sam. Thank you for staying on base. Thank you.
love you so, so much. I love Thank you all. Please share this book with everyone. Come to workshop. And I would love to sign your books. I think I've stopped shaking. Okay, and we do have books, uh, Meredith's books, at uh, Reg, the front register. And then that second one, unfortunately, we're having issues with the one that's closest to here. But if you'll go get your books for yourself, for Thanks your friends, she's Hi, happy to sign and personalize. Nice and I am going to use this opportunity to do a shameless plug for a book passage up 